Okay, so welcome everyone to our uh, Science Cafe. And this um, event will be now, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, I just uh, recall briefly, we uh, first have the um, speech. After that, we will have uh, questions and answers. And after the question and answers, we have uh, um, some time, a little bit of time uh, to, um, if you want to ask uh, uh, questions to our speaker. And it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce uh, the head of the Department of Future Technologies of the University of Turku, Professor Erki Sweden. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's for the recording, yes. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So um, uh, I'm um, telling you regards from the fu uh, Department of Future Technologies that I'm heading since last August. And um, I think by name, it's, it's one of the newest departments at the university. It was just uh, uh, established or, or set up, you know, uh, in the beginning of 2017. It's a merge of uh, departments of information technology and then a technology research center. Um, but it's not named after any discipline. So we give degrees in computer science and information technology and nowadays also phonetics. But um, basically how I interpret uh, the name of the department is that we can do whatever we like which is very nice and I think that's really the mission of the university. Um, um, myself, I'm professor of interaction design, which means, uh, in my interpretation, it means that you know we are doing technologies that help people to understand each other or also themselves. And um, so, you know, um, I'm working in educational technology, but also in, uh, in ICT for development in, in developing countries um, to help people also to understand and, uh, and somehow construct creative solutions for development challenges. Um, then we have like uh, game technologies, Turku Game Lab, uh, which is a joint venture of, um, of um, um, the University of Turku and Turku University of Applied Sciences is also um, you know, in, in my area. And then we have like augmented reality or mixed reality laboratory uh, that, um, that is also working there. So yeah. this... Uh, here, uh, right. you, can you, ca you can hear? Should I come closer? But then if I come closer to someone, so I lose others, yeah, <laughs> yes. Okay, but anyway, so that's... Um, and my background actually is, is in, in algorithm research. So I did my PhD at the University of Helsinki in, in string algorithms. Like, you know, then that was like uh, a bit way back. Um, and then I was working on, on algorithms that then later, you know, became part of this bioinformatics like uh, uh, sequence matching or approximate sequence matching when you have a short sequence and you need to find it in, in a longer sequence, um, like approximately. But um, when I uh, moved to University of Joensuu, then later University of Eastern Finland, so I started working on educational technology. And uh, ah, now there are departmental people from, from our unit, so welcome. <laughs> Some local support. <laughs> so um, anyway, so tonight I'm going to talk about like three things and how they are related to each other. Um, Co-design. Uh, empathy and digital theology. And maybe my mission is something like that, that we need co-design in order to come up with any meaningful applications. Uh, by that I mean that applications that would make sense to their users. So we need co-design. But in order to do co-design, the, the key issue is empathy. So we need to understand not just the needs of people, but you know the very subjective demands and requirements of people. Um, and that's not very useful either. Co-design is very rare. Empathy is, is, is not that often used in, uh, even as a word in, in design. And then I'm also going to talk about digital theology, which means that in some cases, um, the empathy of the users um, actually uh, requires us also to co-design applications that have sort of existential, um, existential reference or, or um, 
or aspect, which I, I think is quite important. Digital theology, theology as a field is, is, is sort of quite new. I have now um, the first two PhD students who are doing digital theology for earning their uh, PhD in computer science. It is uh, quite rare, uh, even universally. Anyway, uh, so this is more or less, you know, the topic. And please intervene whenever you like um, and, and come up with your questions. So first, starting from this co-design. So what does co-design actually mean? So co-design means that actually we work together with people, with the users of the future technology. The idea of future technology here is that, you know, we are not sort of, uh, well, basically, ideally, um, as an um, academic department, we should not be, um, uh, okay, maybe we should at some point, but we should not uh, primarily uh, be supporting, for example, startups, but we should actually be creating technologies which are much ahead of what the stats up are now working on. And I think that if you think of information technology departments globally, so they have not um, done that part of the work quite well. Um, and that, for example, is seen uh, in the fact that most innovations and, and big innovations, like for example, relational databases, which is a key technology for data storage, is actually an invention from industry, not from academia. So we see that you know many inventions are, ca are done and, and, and uh, achieved in, uh, in, in companies and industry rather than universities. And I think that that's one of the reasons is that um, academic departments in information technology are, are either, uh, you know, uh, supporting uh, industry or then we just happen to have less talented people at academia than industry. And you know, you know the salaries <laughs> are also, you know, something that may be affected here. Um, anyway, um, as an example of co-design, um, I, I, I raise up a couple of issues. Um, one of my PhD students at my former university was working on on um, on digital storytelling in HIV and AIDS education, and his fieldwork was, mo was mostly in Tanzania, where you know the the HIV AIDS, HIV prevalence is about 25 percent. 30% in, in, in many communities. So um, what he was working on, he wanted to come up with an application that actually would help people to understand the reasons that lead uh, to HIV or AIDS. And the idea was that you know he would be working actually with high school kids, and in that case girls, um, um, that were about 15 year old girls. And then, you know, he started to interview the girls uh, to get um, some ideas or, you know, to get them to, uh, to, to tell stories about how HIV and AIDS have influenced, you know, their uh, families' lives and so on. But that's a big taboo in, in, uh, in, at least in Africa and probably in many other places as well. So then, you know, the kids at school were very reluctant so they, because they were ashamed of the stories. And of course, alternatively, you know, how we are using technology in AIDS, HIV and AIDS education. We have all these sort of information sites that people can learn about things. But they are usually done, for example, by retired nurses. And, you know, the life of a retired nurse is, 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 is uh, slightly different from a teenager. And um, or or for young young adult, and and so they don't actually speak to the users. So um, anyway, um, these kids um, at the, uh, at this secondary school, which was about 500 kilometers from Dar es Salaam, um, so they were um, they they haven't been really using you know technology. Maybe maybe having been using it a little bit, but never, for example, did any programming. So um, then uh, Marcus Duveskuk, who, who was the PhD student, who is a um, Swedish citizen but lives now in South Africa and then was living in, in, in different parts of Africa. So, um, so he started to, uh, to teach them like flash programming and flash environment to be able actually to, to do this sort of uh, um, 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 platform. And um, 
and then later, you know, the, the, the students, the kids were quite excited of that because they, they understood that they're learning new skills. And, and also, little by little, they understood that some other people could actually learn from these real life stories. So, and then, you know, uh, Marcus also managed to get some uh, artists like, like uh, actors and, and, uh, um, and visual artists, uh, you know, uh, to belong to the group so that they, they did it kind of interactive. Um, uh, graphic novels or graphic stories at least, you know, of that, which are quite um, uh, real life stories. And what then happened is that because, you know, the kids, they were very much um, co-designing things. So it was not that someone was um, making a questionnaire or, or interview on what you would like to expect, you know, from this sort of uh, service. They really were coding it together. And then what actually happened was that, you know, when the final result came, so um, the children actually were not any more ashamed of the stories, but they were proud of the stories because they understood that other people can learn from these stories and maybe live differently or make other choices in their lives. So um, this is just one example of this, um, and now my wife's coming. So um, <laughs> she knows all these stories so by heart, I, I can imagine. Uh, but but anyway, so um, so this is a typical example of um, of, of a co-design um, activity. It means that actually also people that are part of the co-design process, they also need to learn the technology that they are using in in order to to really be able to contribute to the design. Because if you don't know the technology, if you don't master the technology, there is no way that you actually can uh, can have your contribution. And, um, and there are many other, uh, other areas. Um, I think that I just today read an article from, I think it was Ulen News, that for example, medical doctors are fighting, not with patients, but with the software that they are using, because no one never, ever was listening to what kind of applications, you know, the, the medical doctors actually would like to use. So then the technology becomes to prevent, um, be becomes to prevent any, any meaningful uh, use of technology. And we already can see, like, not only like with medical doctors, but, uh, but you know, people at many places, um, uh, in, in many working places, they are all the time stressed because, you know, the technologies that, that is, is a key instrument for them to carry out their work does not actually make sense or then, you know, it's very hard to use or, or maybe it solves questions other that, uh, that they would like to, to, to do. So, uh, so the stress level at, at the working place is very high because of the wrongly designed technology. Um, one of the... One of the recent, um, uh, or recently started uh, um, initiatives that I'm working on is, is called uh, Life Before Death. And, and that started um, uh, with uh, maybe three years ago, something like that, you know, when we were at this uh, Karonkar, this, you know, this after party of, of a PhD defense. And, and then my former student, uh, who was then about 30, maybe 38, father of three, um, said that, you know, he got diagnosed with a cancer that uh, most probably could not be cured. Um, and and um, apparently he would die um, in, in, in less than five years. Uh, so then maybe uh, something like maybe one or two years after that, you know, he invited to me, uh, me to his home and um, and he said that now you know all the um, all the um, you know the the the, the kind of um, curing healthcare you know has been finished you know they only treat you know the the syndromes uh, because you know it, it has the cancer has gone so far that there is nothing to be done that was September and um, I visited his home and you know what what Finnish people do when they are either uh, joyful or or, or or sad things, you know, you go to sauna. So I went to sauna with him. I was a bit um, um, concerned because he already, you know, you could see in his body that, you know, 
he was um, quite ill already. But then you know when you are there naked, and and there is the naked truth that you are working on. So um, and talking about. So then I asked him like how he would would f how he would feel how he would would feel about us starting to work um, on an application that would help people to prepare for their own death. Because it was a bit a dramatic question, but but on the other hand, um, the situation also was dramatic. And I think that at academia, you know, we should, at least in my field, um, we should uh, be part of the real life. I mean that there is still a kind of ivory tower thing, you know, um, around universities, and and you know we and and that's for some areas it's very cool that you know you have a place, quiet place where you can focus on your research. I certainly admit that. But in 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 um, in areas like mine, you should have you know this very close link. So you can do research in a sauna with your former student who has been diagnosed terminally ill. So then, um, and then we, we, I gave it a, a start, you know, this, this uh, initiative. Um, and that was way back, that was like 2015, September. And then I had just been selected or, or chosen here, you know, to work at the University of Turku um, as computer science prof. And, um, but then I still had promised to give one last course, you know, at Joensu, at the University of Eastern Finland. And uh, the name of that course was actually digital theology. So we were talking about um, various questions uh, with an internationally group of students. Finnish students usually don't select my courses at all. So I, I usually only have international students for some reason. Maybe they don't know about any alternatives or something like that, but anyway. So um, then I had a group of students. I had one student from Finland and he was from Savo, and that's almost like a foreign country as well. So, um, uh, but anyway, <laughs> so we were talking about like different aspects of digital theology, like how you can use technology for people to express, you know, like their existential <laughs> questions. But then um, after this couple of lectures, I, I don't do much lectures. So um, this kind of exception now, <laughs> so. And, uh, but then, uh, then we had a hackathon, so like 24 hours, you know, um, experience of doing something together. So I invited all these, I think they were 12 students from different countries and different um, religions and, and non-religions. Um, um, and then we went, um, and I didn't tell about what, you know, the, the exercise would be all about. But when we gathered there Friday evening, of course, the students were expecting a very joyful and nice and, you know, like a little bit like free weekend. And then, you know, I started to, to tell a little bit about this patient, uh, this patient also, but my former student. And then I had my, my PhD student there, Eva, who had just, um, uh, what is by a case no? Miscarriage. Miscarriage. So she, she had had miscarriage just that day. So she was telling about her miscarriage. I was telling about my former student. And then Eva, you know, the one with miscarriage, also told about her uh, sister that had died like a year before, and you know, sort of like her last Facebook, um, you know, uh, pages, and, and like how she was going through her coming death, you know, with, um, um, with, with her uh, closest ones on Facebook, and, and also the existential questions, you know, questions of life and death. And um, and then you, you can just imagine what happened among the students. <laughs> so suddenly, you know, there's quite a lot of silence, you know, and, and people didn't, I mean, I mean, the expectations of a nice, you know, like joyful weekend with a lot of laughter actually changed. But then, um, um, and um, you know, that was in Kite, you know, Kite is the origin or, or the birthplace of, of Nightwish. So we had some music there also. And, and then, you know, uh, students were not by White Nightwish though, but but by, by the music teacher that had identified, you know, the, the, the boys in White Nightwish and also the girl. Um, but then um, in the three groups, uh, students started to share about like their, uh, their uh, experiences and story, stories of their relatives that or friends that had died. And, and they d did like socio dra drama, you know, like you, you, you tra take roles, you, you, you sort of, um, learn to, to, to get some sort of empathy in, 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 in the, um, in the uh, topic. And, um, 
And then, you know, what turned out is that, you know, they wanted to see that, after all, you are still alive. And, you know, the, the, the technology should actually help you to, life, to live as strongly as you can, the very last uh, months or last years or last days even of your life. And, you know, it was amazing when, when you know, when they figure out that, you know, uh, the, the whole atmosphere changed back to a very joyful and, and uh, but in, in different kind of joyful environment because they, they could see that they can do something meaningful, you know, even for the users at this very last uh, stages of their lives. So um, then we started to work a little bit on that. Um, and now this has turned out to be quite a challenging theme. We got the first um, first version, like 2016, you know, with, uh, with the University of Applied Science Group. And um, we had also some, um, some um, therapists and, and counselors from Diaconia University of Applied Sciences, you know, who are um, counselors of terminally ill uh, patients and also teaching that area. Uh, Riley Gottuni was, was one of these, and so we got the first one now. Recently we have been working with, uh, with medical doctors specialized in palliative care, and, um, and, and <laughs> you can imagine, it took me a long, long time until I could find the first uh, student that would be happy to go and, and work with terminally ill patients in order to develop this application. Because the idea is that if any, any software or any application, so this sort of application would require that people who are in that particular situation of facing the reality of their own death, you know, they need to contribute. They need to be part of this. And, um, okay, so we found um, the first, I, I have a PhD student. PhD students are easier to catch. But, but you know, like, <laughs> like students who are, are younger and, and, and um, have a lot of other opportunities, you know, so they are very hard. But anyway, I found one, and then just a few weeks back, we went to Pori, um, you know, hospice. Um, and, um, and we stayed there like maybe three hours, and then, then we were... Um, you know, then one of the patients who was like 82, 83 year old uh, man. So he invited us to, to go there. And, um, and the idea of this, um, this application, as far as we had sort of uh, been thinking of it, is, is that, you know, it should be also based on stories, digital stories. And by digital or interactive stories, I mean stories which you can uh, represent on a digital media. You can also like merge different stories together. You can uh, analyze the stories. You can, for example, detect emotions from the stories. You can see the mood of people when they are writing stories and that sort of stuff. So um, we were thinking that maybe you know the application should be there to, for people to to tell and share their stories, um, and and, uh, um, and and really to uh, to understand uh, the 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 meaning of their life. And, and then at some point, maybe my, my wife who is somewhere here. Um, so <laughs> she, she also uh, was listening to this uh, presentation or lecture of, um, of, a Muslim, uh, of a Portuguese medical doctor who is working on, on, um, on um, dignity therapy in palliative care so that you, know, you see that your life, even at the last uh, stages, is very, very, um, it has dignity. And when we went, you know, to this, and then you have like few questions that you uh, would help you to, to come up with a story that would help you to identify uh, the dignity of your life and, and share it also. Maybe, maybe you want to share it, maybe not, but many people want to share. So then, you know, we went to this person of 82 year old and, you know, in that particular um, hospice, the average, uh, time that these patients are living there is five days. Of course, it's just the average, but anyway, it's five days. And now this happened like two, three uh, weeks ago. And, um, and I, I have to say that I almost never, ever have met with, with a person that would be so much alive than this person was. And, and you know, he just was looking for an opportunity to to share his experiences of his life, what he had been learning. And you know, um, he, he said a few times that he's not bitter, 
but it turned out that um, uh, he was a kind of ordinary, um, you know, um, a guy, a working class guy who had been working in Rosenle factory, you know, assemble like uh, tractors or something like that. And and he told to me that you know he had like a few inventions, uh, but the immediate boss who didn't know anything about technology always was against of the new inventions and even like you know cancelled his contract, you know, because he was too inventious. Um, so it, it's amazing, like you know, what kind of stories. And this is only one person. And he was telling about like um, like his family. He also was telling like how um, how he would like to be buried, you know, what should be done with the ashes and so on. So it was quite concrete. It was a long discussion. Um, and then I said that, you know, I'm going to meet. I, I met with the prime minister now last Monday. And I was speaking on behalf of the university. He visited us. And, and then I, I asked him whether he has uh, also some some uh, regards to the prime minister. He said, yes, a lot, and, and he had, and, you know. And one of the most interesting was that, you know, I didn't yet say that to the prime minister, but he said that, you know, politics should be understood as a problem-solving exercise, so that rather than fighting, people should really very openly try to come up with, um, with solutions, creative solutions, and I think that made a lot of sense. So, um, but we were talking about innovations, we were talking about robotics and all that sort of stuff. And, and um, he was really following like what was happening. So, um, and I see that, you know, there are so many stories that we can learn from these people. And, and we all know that, you know, people close to their death also have like a lot of secrets that they never were able to, to share and which would be very important to share. So this is, and, and, and computer actually works as a neutral platform as it worked, you know, with these kids, you know, in Tanzania, because, you know, they couldn't share the stories orally because they were ashamed of them, but they could share them on, on the uh, computer platform because it was a kind of neutral platform for them to tell what happened and what might have happened and so on. So these are a couple of examples of co-design, and I have been talking, let me see for how long, oh, anyway. <laughs> but but you, you see the point of co-design. But now co-design, of course, requires, uh, and then there are many other examples, but I'm not now going to those. But then it uh, also requires that, um, that we learn empathy. And empathy is not really like a topic on our curriculum. I mean, we don't have any empathy exercises in, in computer science or information technology. And certainly, we, we, we should have. Um, so um, I read recently a PhD study from University of Pretoria, and that was in informatics, like, informa uh, like um, information systems uh, research. And, uh, and they were working on, um, and that was um, probably a Zimbabwean uh, PhD student, and he was working on, on an application that would help um, uh, mothers, like young mothers, that just uh, deliver a child, a baby, you know, to um, so that you know these people would benefit um, in terms of the mother's and baby's health, and 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 how how you can design you know that sort of application. And usually these applications, unfortunately, are ideated in somewhere like the global north, you know, with people that never delivered any child <laughs> and have no babies either, and, and you know, like, and 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 uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, might have no clue of, of the environment there. And usually, you know, if you think of this kind of app, you might think that, okay, let's start with, uh, with asking for the mother's name and address. You know, quite typical stuff that, you know, if you want to follow, you know, someone, you at least want to know the, the identity. But it turned out that, you know, no mother in, in Harare, the, the capital of Zimbabwe, is that stupid that would tell her real name and address to the hospital because that would probably lead into invoice that they never could pay. So, so you see that even you know the the, the very first ideas of the application usually are wrong. So then you know they were following like like a Stanford um, um, origin uh, um, design method, which actually starts from empathy. That you know the the the, the first aspect of of any design work is empathy. So you should understand your um, uh, your future users. 
And and what they did was that you know they asked like uh, mothers who had delivered a, a baby to actually you know write uh, kind of diaries, and then you know the diaries were shared you know among this design team, and um, and then you know some of these diaries were uh, were um, copied you know into this PhD thesis, and and there were like um, there was except but there were like sort of success story and then there was like non success story and one of the non success stories was telling about a mother uh, who had of course they always need to walk you know to the hospital which might be a few kilometers and you go there deliver a child that very day so you walk there five kilometers you know just before the delivery you deliver and in the, her case you know um, the father came maybe next day and next day he also needed to she needed to come back the father was not at all very happy that she had delivered a, a, a girl rather than a boy. So then he disappeared, went to, to the mother-in-law, so, so his mother, to probably complain about, uh, about you know, the, the wife. And then the wife, um, uh, the next day after the, the delivery, walked back home just to figure out that, you know, um, she can't, you know, milk, milk the, 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 the baby. And so she, so the baby couldn't, uh, didn't get anything to, to eat. And then you know, next day she walked back, uh, uh, just to realize you know that the hospital was already had too many patients, so that she needed to walk back the same day without getting any support. And next day she walked back, and then you know they put this. Um, how do you say this? That's very good that you are here. The, the nest there, to serve the ivy there. Uh, the doctor had um, had ordered the IV, but uh, the nurses disagreed, so they took the IV away, and the kid died in a few hours. And and a kid wi which had which was not ill at all, but just you know, uh, the mother didn't know how to how to give her food and so. So anyway, there were these sort of stories, um, and um, and when when the co-design uh, you know work started. So it started by sharing these stories and and, and having also a few mod, uh, m mothers there um, um, to talk. So it started actually. You can imagine, you, you know, if you think of all these con army, armies of consultants that are doing these apps usually. So it started by <laughs> by people uh, crying together because of the stories. So you really could deliver. Uh, you know, you could. Uh, create that sort of empathic uh, environment to to understand where we are starting from, and then that was the start of of this. And and during the the studies, they actually during his study, they managed to come up with some uh, concrete uh, applications that would help you know these these people to um, to to benefit uh, from information that information that would make sense to these people. We have so much information that doesn't make any sense, but in this case, you know, we, this is the key thing. Uh, so empathy is, is very important. I have a, um, a postdoc um, researcher, you know, at the department, and, and he wants to become a docent in empathic computing. And I, I really, really like, you know, this idea of empathic computing. It means, you know, computing that helps, um, that that you know, I, I would say that it comes up with kind of aesthetic design. You know, an aesthetic. If you go to the etymology of the word aesthetic, it means that you are um, mm, something is touching you by your own your all senses, your all senses. So usually, when we think of um, of um, of technology, we we usually think of not uh, like two senses, like the sight and hearing. You know, those are the Usually only maybe visuals. That's the main sense, and then we forget about others. But just you know, talking about and 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 this this empathy is something like empathy computing is something that you know um, technologies that y r you really that help you really to 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 understand a situation, a phenomenon, whatever by all your senses. I think that you know in 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 um, uh, in general in academia. We give we prioritize other senses more than uh, than some others. Um, talking about the senses, so um, we are getting to a department, uh, to the department, a visiting professor for half a year, and and he is um, he has um, uh, his uh, job is, is professor of um, in City University of London, but now he is in in Malaysia, 
has created a, a lab around remote sensing and um, and some of his students are coming you know to to us and one of them just today I was talking about about her she is uh, going to work on um, or she's actually going to to create and and it turns out that I will be also co-supervising her is um, uh, it's called Kissinger and that's basically remote kissing technology for remote kissing so you can see that in remote kissing if you want to do remote kissing you need not only visual you know the sense but some other senses as well and and so these are kind of interesting that you know where where you know this sort of <laughs> empathic computing actually takes us in the future so um so co-design we do co-design but in order to do co-design we need to 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 empathize we we need to somehow get into the boots of other people we need to understand their reality we need to understand their subjective requirements and demands rather than needs that someone else gave them i i was two years in mozambique i was i was the chief technical advisor in the science technology and innovation program and I, I really figure out that, that you know, when we talk about these uh, developing countries, usually we talk about needs. Uh, and needs are some that are sort of super, uh, you know, some superiors of these people give these people. Say, for example, the United Nations might say that we here have all these needs satisfied. But the people that are basically lower than us, are below us, they also need to get not all that we have, but some fundamental things in a certain order of priority. And, and usually people are quite offended of this sort of approach. It's a little bit like, you know, like the teachers usually when, when the Ministry of, Foreign, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Education says that now teachers should do this and that. So it, it's a little bit like patronizing, you know, you patronize people's professional pride, you know, because you say that you could do better if these and these needs that you have are satisfied by technology. But these uh, teachers might not feel that need at all. So then why to do this? And, and that's why we need this sort of uh, you know, empathy. The third thing is, is that um, in some cases, um, people, people's needs or demands, actually demands, um, wants, desires, are related also to existential questions. Um, like, you know, as I, I told about life before death and, and, and so on. Um, but also, if you think of the very conflictive world that we are living now, with people who have uh, whose um, um, ideas of ex uh, answers to existential questions are very diverse. Um, I'm, I'm a Christian myself. Um, I I'm, I'm happen to be also a, an evangelical Lutheran pastor. Um, and I, I do these sort of things every now and then. Um, but, um, but then I have, of course, at our department, we have a lot of Muslims. Uh, we have a lot of people, and I have a lot of people who, who are at, at, atheists, um, or agnostics, or then, you know, we have, uh, my, my very close friend in, in Germany is, is, a, is a Buddhist, and, and, and he said that, you know, the reason for him to be a Buddhist is because, you know, his grandfather was, uh, was a member of this uh, confessing church in, in Nazi Germany, you know, which was like, you know, the church that wanted to, um, wanted not to follow, you know, the Nazi German regime. And, and um, he said that now that he as a grandson is, is a bad Buddhist, so, so he feels, um, he feels that, you know, the, the, uh, the 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 uh, grandfather might might disagree, but he said that he's Buddhist because you know for him it seems to be that uh, Christianity um, prevents all the all the nice things <laughs> that you can do in life, and you know that's that's a was a quite interesting thing. Um, uh, but anyway, now that we have this um, uh, diversity, and and certainly when you are in Africa, the first question is like like. What's your religion? You know, which church or, or mosque you go to? So, um, so many of the conflicts might have, you know, also roots in in different kinds of understanding of existential question. And, and these questions, to some people, whether one believes or no, also not believes, 
um, is it, it, they're somehow so sensitive that that you know differences cause conflicts and 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 battles and whatever, at least disagreement. And and one of the things in in this digital theology also is that you know we would like to come up you know with some sort of applications that would help people to to come in terms you know with this diversity so that you know when I send a message I could maybe get some sort of idea like how you know the recipient would understand my message because you know like what I do and what I say uh, might be just fine but the problem is that the other person just interprets it differently so does not interpret it in the way that I, I wanted to, to to tell that so this is one, one of the things um, I have um, these two uh, PhD students that um, I now start to supervise in, in digital theology. The other one actually has a PhD from University of Edinburgh in, in, in the New Testament studies, but he, he is interested in, in the hermeneutics of technology. Like, how does technology mean? So, so that's the key issue, like how technology means. Like when when you have um, not only information but when you have some gadget or technology. So what is the the, the added um, aspect of this technology that somehow changes uh, you know the meaning of, of information? Um, the other one is 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 excited of um, of um, of um, of the dynamics of of religion or dynamics of faith. So that you know by analyzing social media. How can you understand? Well, he's based in 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 in, um, in metropolitan London, so so he's interested in seeing and visualizing and doing a little bit of data data science here or at least data mining to to see like like what's on in social media in terms of religion, you know, like like how the dynamics is is doing. Um, so these are these are some things, um, and um, yes, but I think that. Um, I think there is yeah I'm I'm covered like 40 minutes now I think so I I I think I'm more or less done now for the first part and 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 sorry that I was talking so much that no one even was intervening but if you have any questions so Thank you very much I'm sure there will be many questions thanks I mean myself I have 3 but I will not ask them all together but I perhaps I could start with one yeah. uh, and um, this is related to um, the use uh, of uh, co-design and um, digital technologies um, in, in, in certain cases that you were mentioning I remember when I was 18 I was uh, volunteering uh, in a um, uh, it was about a month uh, in a place in a house where um, people were dying of HIV AIDS mm. this was not in uh, uh, in, in Africa, this was actually in northern Italy, yeah. but it's 25 years ago, so mm. people were really dying. Now you can take medicine if you are mm. HIV positive and you live mm. basically forever. Mm. And my feeling was that when being there, um, what these people wanted really, or th th the most useful thing that we could do there, was just to talk with them, being present. They wanted human connection. That, that was really what was the crucial thing. And in which way? somehow technology or co-design can uh, improve uh, on, on the fact that, you know, maybe you just have a person who is sitting there and listening to you. Yeah, okay, that's a very good question, thank you. Well, first of all, we know that, you know, um, the, the staff, you know, and even, even the number of volunteers I mean, might be different in Italy, but certainly in Finland, I mean, this sort of volunteerism, you know, is, is not that common. Like, for example, that you would have people to go to hospital or to go to hospice, to, to, to stand by or sit by, you know, um, a, a dying patient. And, and also I have to say that, you know, my, my two students, uh, you know, that was their first reaction also that, you know, you see that this person wanted to talk, wanted to have someone to talk, and maybe even some outsider, because, you know, the, the close family, of course, are also very uh, sad about, you know, uh, how things are going, you know, to, to see like a dying, very close yeah, person. Yeah. So I mean, in this case, they didn't even have family because exactly, we are yes. talking 25 years ago. Yes. It's they were mostly prostitutes yes, yes. of heroin addicts, yeah, yes. people, which you know. Yeah. Yes. But 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 you know, when I I think, for example, and, and where where all this discussion started, you know, with my former student. So so he was already at home. He he actually stayed home for his past four uh, months. 
and he was there, you know, with the family, with the wife and the three kids, and there were quite often, you know, like, you know, visitors coming. But still he said that, you know, there are the long nights uh, that he just can't, you know, sleep for various reasons. And, you know, the closest one that, you know, he had there was the computer. So the, the technology was there, you know, and, and we, we would like to have, you know, see like how technology can, can work as a little bit like um, Sherry Turkle talked about uh, technology being the second self somehow, you know, kind of reflection uh, platform which would allow you to express maybe also, um, uh, maybe even somehow um, come up with, again, I would say neutral questions uh, that would, would help you to, to maybe find another perspective I into your fight and battle. Something like that. But then, of course, we, we talk about technology that is it's not primary technology so that, you know, you would have a computer with all these things, but it should be, like, as light as possible so that you, 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 could, you could do it. Like, um, for example, in ALS, you know, Stephen Hawking, you know, had, had been diagnosed for ALS for a long time. And, and I heard, you know, that's way back, you know, when, when someone with, with ALS uh, diagnosis could actually wanted to, to tell, like, maybe it was her, her story. So the only thing was that, you know, he could, um, or she could, uh, y you know, use this sort of um, eye tracking thing so that, you know, he it was possible to write by just eye tracking, you know, letter by letter. So so we have also technologies uh, that would help people to, to communicate when that's not possible by, by ordinary means. So, so um, so yeah. you would say it's rather than replacing, it would be complementing. Yeah, it would uh, be complementing. Yeah. I think that you know it's always that you know technology should complement. It's a little bit like the same if you think of educational technology. Um, in Finland, we have a lot of educational technology. We also have a lot of uh, teachers. But my uh, PhD student from Nigeria, who is um, um, who is a university lecturer at, at the Northern uh, Nigeria, you know, well, Boko Haram is quite strong um so he said when i was asking like why he would like to to uh, to, to to study this educational technology he said that you know um he would also like to complement his role as teacher because in every class that he's teaching he has 2000 students so we see that that can't be very personal and and then technology is there actually to make it personal and individualize it. So, so this is quite interesting. And when we had, I don't know if, if any of you uh, managed to join this David Levy's presentation on, on, on sex, love, and marriage with robots. So, so his message was also that you know there are people that for some reason or other just can't find any any close people to live with them. And you know then you know you talk about robots as a complementary, you know. So, so I think this is very. But of course, it all starts from understanding people's situation. Okay, other questions? Yes. Uh, you, you told us about uh, your colleague you went to sauna with who mm. died, right? Mm. Uh, how did he die? And uh, how were his last days? And how did you experience that uh, as a person and uh, as a pastor? Mm. Okay, so um, so then that happened at Joensuu when I was already in Turku. So I just, you know, got this uh, this SMS actually from from um, his wife um, that you know he had um, he he went to hospital with the wife, you know, to to get some um, some small operation, you know, to to kind of temporary situation, and uh, but then the operation or the small operation was done but then after all he died after that for for some reason that um and and then the last days in 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 his case i think that um it, it was quite and i i have to say that i i met with him a couple of times you know during these four months uh, but but he he tended to be very strong and and he was he was thinking of like not himself, but he was thinking like how you know the the kids can can um, you know now that he is not there. So how can the kids you know um, live like um, strongly and and where where can they get support? And and he was very concerned also 
as was the, the person that I met at the hospice, very concerned about, you know, this very conflictive world that, you know, why, why would people actually to fight against, uh, why would people fight against each other? So, so that, uh, because of course, like when you are approaching your death, so you see that there are other values, it, it, you know, fighting with others, uh, uh, defending your viewpoint is maybe not uh, the primary thing. But rather, it's something that you know people should live together and and give space to others. So this this was, but now the, the, the statistical sample, if you will, is is very small. But but um, but I think that you know also what we think is that you know the stories from people that are dying uh, are are very very important. Um, I'm talking about this <laughs> and age. So I I read recently this book by never. Never, how, how is it, baby? Never, um, never um, mm, clean the tears by by your uh, by your um, play by hands. You know, it's it's a story of of 1980s uh, from 1980s in in Stockholm when when you know um, finally homosexual people would be able to find a place to live in peace in the society. And then at the same time, you know, the AIDS, HIV and AIDS struck, you know, there. And uh, and I think that also when you think of this this uh, book, which is based on, on true stories, so you can see that um, that finally you 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 are look you you are thinking in, in terms of reconciliation. Reconciliation is something. So I think that you know the stories that we are learning from is um, is is also a very important thing. Questions? Ah, okay. My wife always wants to comment. Now we get another lecture. So. <laughs> No. Counter lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the science a lot, but I really wish you wouldn't prefer the remote kissing to true kissing. <laughs> well, I don't know. You, you don't. Know. <laughs> well, it uh, yeah. I was two years, you know, in Mozambique, you know, um, and and then my wife decided to stay in Finland, and you know that application might have been, you know, <laughs> useful, but then after the two years. Anyway, closer to the end of the two years, you know, I called my wife and said that, you know, I might consider staying the, the third year also there. And she, her reaction was that, please take your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, one question. Thank you. Um, this is um, the second lecture I have heard from you. And the second time you mentioned that you, uh, as a scientist, you live in your ivory tower. Mm. And I was just wondering that are you really trying to get out of there? Mm. In the means that do you contact these, um, not maybe startups, but the companies who are doing the things that you want to do and who are who are inventing these things that you want to invent or you want to with want to be involved because at the moment I'm seeing that you have you don't have any like the contact in, uh, API <laughs> to these type of people for example in here that you are who are listening to your lectures then might help with your intentions and who have these companies, uh, who are working with these companies, do you have anything for them? Uh, thanks you, thank you very much for the questions. I think that this this is also like my interest to meet with people, I, I mean like, like here, and I would be very, very happy to work, you know, with, with people who are interested, not only in these things, but also could, could you know, so some new areas that you know I could get like my my students or researchers to work on. I mean that you know this sort of like finding each other, finding each other in Turku um, is not always you know the easiest thing, um, and um, and um, but but certainly I mean um, we we try to 
well, well as, as the head of the department, I, I tried to get like our department out of the closet. So that's why we had, you know, first, you know, this, this sort of open house, which we want to have like once a year. But now we also ha start, you know, some sort of debates, uh, you know, uh, sessions. And the first one is that's going to speak is Ture Parkinen. And I think that the startup community should know Ture Parkinen, who, who was the managing director at, at Rescue for some time and now was, uh, was got this, uh, con you know, conviction, how do you say, you know, of, uh, jail for for some time so so he's going to come soon but okay i'm i'm not only think of the jail the startup people or uh, but, but, but but i would be very happy and and uh, y you know to work and um and and you know there are so many ways because as i said in like our department we can do we have license to do whatever we like or others like to do with us so i mean this is just an open invitation to work and 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 certainly that's that's very very maybe i have been also a bit um, maybe lazy in in getting out of my office myself but um or maybe maybe it has been when i started there so um uh, it was maybe also a bit like i needed to to work for the department um but certainly for for the opening of the department um and um and then I tend to work quite a lot also overseas. But I mean that, you know, those who are, you know, from the startups, so feel welcome to the department and we are very, very happy to, to work with you. Thanks a lot for, for this. Uh, and um, and I think the the, the university life in, in, in general, I, I know that, you know, some areas in the startup movement, uh, particularly maybe game industry, is thinking that you know to to even open the door of university might be a dismerit and for for creativity <laughs> and and I, and I hope that we can change you know this sort of view. So um, I hope that we can work together you know for quite some interesting things and and um, and I mean this far university has um, counted you know the or evaluated the outcomes in terms of credit points or people have ha, that have got like 55 points whatever in in the year or and um, i think the future is that future of learning is that you know we don't collect degrees we collect like learning experiences from different parts of life we talked with guru logic which is a um, company by heike salmela is, is op operating actually on this street in in this hesburger uh, uh, you know building so we were thinking that maybe we could also start some sort of um, a master um, apprentice-based uh, degree program there within the company. Uh, and now we are thinking of setting up a Bauhaus within the department. You know Bauhaus movement? Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Bauhaus movement actually is a design movement that was invented in 1920s in, in, in Berlin. And in 1920s Berlin was as innovative uh, city as it is now then you know after 10 years it was no more that in, in innovative but but then design this Bauhaus design school was was uh, was created uh, to sort of um, set up um, the, the German design school so that it would be competitive you know with the British and US uh, um, industrial design and it was very much based on like community pedagogy people were living together and designing new things. So we want to, to come up with some sort of like software Bauhaus within our department. And we would be very happy to work on that, you know, together with startups. So if someone wants to to join, so feel feel just very welcome. You can you can come there or you can come to our home. So um, we invite people at our home, you know a lot. So so it's on Marianka to five C forty six. And now this was recorded also, so you can <laughs> address <laughs> okay i have a comment related to yeah. that because you were talking about um you know the university and industry mm. and how most invention are actually done in industries and how universities can actually compete with industries mm. and uh, i had uh, a comment which is also a question and because i think that perhaps there are two reasons in my opinion one is that still part of the university university is you know not all of it uh, 
luckily, but part of it is still aimed at doing fundamental research, so mm. research which is not necessarily leading to any commercial application, and yeah. it's good that it is so. Uh, although it is also fine if uh, other part of the university does more, uh, you know, applicative uh, research. Uh, and the second one is that, honestly, I think that is mostly because industry has much more money than university, which is also what you were saying. So it's not just because they have better people, or it's connected, because they have more money that they can attract more people, but I mean, it's also because they have unbelievably more money, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they can invest more and they can innovate more, perhaps. But I, I think these two aspects are perhaps similar to what you were saying. I don't know, but it's a comment. Yeah, yeah I very much agree on that. I, I think, although that, um, that, like, if you think of, like, the basic research, if you think of, like, for example, relational databases, which then, you know, um, um, I mean, the introduction came by, by very simple things, like how you can make sure that, you know, the, the planes don't fly empty, you know, so that, you know, you, you should create some sort of booking system, like, you know, meaningful booking system, efficient booking system, so that was a very practical question. But then, you know, if you think of relational databases and the relational algebra and all that sort of, like, you know, the... The, the the story after that so so it was um, it was quite interesting and certainly led also to this if you will like blue sky research at least within computer science um, I also think that uh, I think it was maybe Gauss but I'm I'm not sure if it was Gauss but some some of these mathematicians said that you know if if a mathematician can't explain everything that she or he has invented to anyone on the street, the mathematician hasn't understood it by herself or himself. And that's, you know, quite um, quite a brave saying. But I think that, you know, when you are um, in, you know, when you are in dialogue, so, so the dialogue forces you to understand things on a deeper level also. And I think that, you know, we, so, so in that way we should go back to the original academia by Plato and so, so which is like very much on dialogue and, and discussion. Uh, talking about the money, so um, I think money is also something that if you take something seriously, you put money there. And, and I think that somehow, you know, the, the ideas that, you know, uh, we tend to be quite poor in terms of resources, so I'm just wondering if it means that somehow, you know, the society is not taking, you know, university and research finally seriously. And, you know, this is something that I think that also as, as professors, you know, we need to, to be mm, like more, you know, it's, it's not that we would need money to us, but but I think that it's something that, you know, we, we need to emphasize that, that we are serious and, and that's why we need resources, whatever the resources are. Um, and, um, but again, um, like uh, we are now starting collaboration with, with the University of Arts and, and uh, particularly Otso Ladio is a music technologist that is doing postdoc at Sibelius Academy, which is part of Arts University. And um, and he said actually when he visited us a few months back that you know in in music technology he would like to be ahead of 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 the industry or the startups in, in order to to already like like see what's what's coming and um, so there are we, we should maybe uh, be more dynamic I know you are very dynamic you are moving all the time and <laughs> but but we need you know this sort of dynamism so that you know we meet. Uh, and we work at different universities also. I think that, you know, the Finnish university life is very static. So, we, we, you know, you tend to get all the degrees from the same university and you, you want to be, become a professor and rector and whatever, you know, like uh, in the same university. Um, so we, we need more like movement and, and maybe also movement between the university and, and, and industry and, and the rest of the society. Uh, but of course, that depends on the, on the, um, on the, um, the 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 field that we are working. Except that we don't have any field because we are non-disciplinary. No, but it's true that there are differences. Like in physics, for example, if you do the PhD here, you must go abroad. I mean, it's, there is no way you can have a career. I mean, continuing here. So I mean, it's, it's true. Hmm. I agree. I mean, it's field dependent. But in like in our field, is a requirement. 
Yeah, uh, yeah so it it, is, and yeah. I agree with you. Certainly, mm. you need to have much more, you know, dyna dynamic uh, scientific uh, uh, career and uh, connections with different types of uh, um, people, and you know, going yeah. abroad and everything. Yes. I mean. Yeah. You know what I mean. And I, I think, think that also, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I think that also, like, our universities are quite regional. They are more, like, almost geographical that, you know, I even they get the names from the region. And, um, of course, MIT also gets the name from the region. But uh, but it is also operating quite a few different places. And, and maybe we should also think whether we could have uh, a satellite somewhere else. Or, you know, we should welcome a satellite from some other university here. Okay, question. Uh, one, I, uh, yes, I, you will be the next one, but if there is someone, please do like that. Yeah, just a short comment. I just have to say it because we're talking about the money and the companies and the industry. Um, actually, there is, and, and the software. Um, currently, in many software fields, there are very strong open source software areas. So it's I can't agree it's about the money, because for example, I worked for Nokia for like years, and after that I worked for some fields that are very strongly attached to open source software, and there is uh, like huge amount of people, like thousands of people working without money for like some goal, and uh, it's it's very like flat bureaucracy and like not about money it's like working together so it's one option for the university to so so to get into those kind of projects and some universities are there in those open software projects and they are getting lots of value because mm -hmm. they get uh, new perspectives and, and lots of people from other business help them without any money involved. Yeah, I think that it's just about like finding, you know, like natural, uh, you know, and easy, easy to go and, uh, you know, uh, ways of, of working together. And, and uh, I think that, you know, if you think of like our students or PhD students, so, or anyone else, so I would like to see them also working with the industry and also gaining like, you know, their credits out of that. And and so so, but that's possible. I mean, it's it's easy to do that. It's there are no obstacles, you know, from it. So so um, and um, yeah, but maybe also you know the way that um, somehow somehow I think that you know if if not, um, uh, well I I think that somehow you know the startup uh, movement spirit. I think that we should uh, somehow. Um, you know, get that influencing in the universities much more also. You know, like that sort of open spirit of, of doing things. Um, I, I was at a conference in, in some conference in Stanford and, and then I just happened to meet with, um, or sit next to the communications teacher of, of uh, Palo Alto High School. And, and she said that, you know, the first versions of Google were actually coded in, in her garage because, you know, her daughter was dating, you know, with uh, Google, you know, uh, founder. So um, so I think that, you know, um, maybe somehow we, we should also see that, you know, our working should be, and I, I, that's why I really like, you know, this sort of informal setting. And I think that also universities should learn a lot more from this sort of informality. And you know that sort of like like meeting with each other in in the time that uh, environment that is, is 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 good for us, and uh, and I think that the all all the mm, yeah like like uh, again coming back to this life before death. So it started just by just you know this um, you know discussion in with with that person you know like at that uh, party. And maybe also I think that, you know, even the, I have, um, like our laboratory engineer will s now start his PhD studies on on how to make, you know, the, the physical space within the department more inspiring and more creative and something like that. Because even like, uh, I, I'm so sorry to say that, you know, you go to the Department of Future Technologies. So what are your expectations of the physical space? 
of a department of future technologies. You would, of course, think that it's kind of, you know, space shuttle or something like that, or even more. And then you come to an ordinary office, you know, and, and, and that's so bad, you know. So so we are thinking of coming up with, with you know, uh, environment that, that somehow, you know, you would give, you know, the idea that you are already living in the future. And and this is something, okay, we are not only introducing these remote kissing things, but, but you know, <laughs> other things also so that we have been thinking of a kind of smart mirror so that when you look at the mirror, so the mirror would say that, okay, you are doing well or, you know, you should do better, whatever. But, but you know, there are things like that. And, and, um, and um, we some, something like someone is limiting us, which is very, very bad. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I heard it flew, but I will, I try to try to <laughs> ask my question how near we are in, in our other artificial intelligence that we don't need any teachers doctors nurses only computers we uh, almost every every day i can read from the newspaper uh, that we have we have uh, done this and we th this and this uh, with the mobile telephone tele uh, for example to to calculate your heart rate and tell is this, is this something serious or not but what is your your uh, <laughs> vision what is going to happen to, to the normal people <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes maybe normal people are getting sm more smart when they can use AI like a can transplant or <laughs> something like that but okay but but um, I, I think that you know with every new technology there has always you know been this um, uh, this this kind of threat that you know um, that uh, I, I just read it yesterday from some source but I don't remember what was it but but even like at the introduction of printing press uh, you know there were concerns that now people are just reading books and doing nothing more not you know going around in the nature and something like that but everyone because of the printing press are just you know uh, ending up reading books or reading something just reading um, that was like one example but there were many many other examples of of, um, of fears I think that you know building up to future and that that's maybe related to this empathy also that you know uh, we we need it. It's kind of our responsibility to come up with technologies that that you know make the l the world better. I think that you know there has been a lot of um, discussion that in many many ways you know like our world is actually much better now in in you know in several dimensions, and and much of those depends actually on science and its applications. You know whether that's like physical science or natural science or social science or whatever. Um, it has been that we are being able to express us better. We are we are uh, being able to live in a more tolerant world, um, and and I think that you know like this AI is one of the things that that we need to develop in that way that you know that will enrich our lives and enhance our lives and and help us to do things that are not a uh, we are not able to do right now. Um, and that's why I think that really like, because there has been, even Stephen Wa Hawking has, has warned us that, you know, we should almost like limit, you know, the, the, the research in, in AI. But then the question is that someone is going to do AI research anyway. And if we are going to limit ourselves from doing like AI research, so, so it might be a very, very bad decision. Uh, because I think that, you know, we still have like the ethical, you know, um issues uh correct and so i remember now i shouldn't mention you know the university but i i i visited way back a university and um in some other country than finland and and they said that they are doing this sort of um text mining research to be able to uh to to identify like Falun Gong movement members. So you basically, li the, the idea was that, you know, you are doing like like web mining or, or text mining for political reasons, you know, to, to be able to, to trace, you know, kind of um, 
troublemakers. And then, you know, we talk about quite a scary approach uh, to technology development. And I think also that's why, why it's so important to, to, to really like have this sort of inclusive approach and comprehensive pro approach and discussions with whatever ordinary people means. But, you know, people that, you know, would, would, would have demands. If you just think of um, people who can't express themselves nowadays, and if there were some sort of technologies to help them to come up with, with ideas, uh, and, you know, like, like make their voices heard, so that would be very, very important. I was just a week back, I was in New York, I was visiting the Institute of Inst International Education, which is an organization which is funding, for example, the Fulbright program. And it, it has been operating for the past hundred years. And, and it started, you know, at the time of Russian Revolution um, as an instrument to bring Russian uh, uh, sort of persecuted researchers out of Soviet Union. And then later, you know, it, 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 um, it was rescuing. They, they set up this scholar rescue fund. So they were rescuing researchers also from Nazi Germany, apartheid South Africa. And now after all these hundred years, uh, Trump started as the president, and now the, the trip is done. So, <laughs> I mean, people can't be rescued from certain countries anymore. And, and, and there was a um, question also for Finland, you know, whether Finland actually could be a rescue place for talented people from, uh, from a troubled environment and, and, and to, to, to really, like, develop technologies that, that you know, are there to to improve, you know, life. I, I, I would say that that's the emphasis. And we, we still have, I mean, the the opportunities that we can make this in this world and, and what we can do are far from finished. And I think that AI is just one uh, tool, an instrument in, in that trip. Yes, one question here. Thanks for the very interesting lecture. What I was thinking when I was listening to you is uh, how co-design, because I work in education my myself, in, in uh, basic education. What I was thinking is that um, co-design is already used as a, uh, because we see many benefits in the uh, learning process when we are using co-design uh, in the process itself. Um, what do you think about that for kids using co-design for learning purposes? I think we, we have, you know, some ideas uh, or some, some things. We are working with basketball school, you know, the, the, the primary school. And, and um, there, you know, we are working on, on, on how, you know, kids can learn mathematics better uh, by, by actually designing a composing environment on a computer or so something like that. But then, of course, you need, like, need to learn technology in order to design. So, so I'm I'm quite excited of that. Way back um, at Yonsu, so we we started, you know, this um, and this what we call kids club. Uh, that's I think was something like 2000, and uh, we have four kids. The youngest one is, is has this ADHD, and you know maybe I have as well. He anyway thinks that I have at least I have it, but. Um, but, you know, he had really, like, hard to con concentrate, and he was in a special school. And then what we started at the department is that, you know, we, we invited, you know, like about maybe 10 to, to, to 15 kids uh, with, AIDS, with, uh, with um, Asperger or, or autism or ADHD, you know, to come and, and work with robots. So they were actually designing and they were programming robots together. And, and what was very nice to see is that whereas, you know, the... Usually, you know, the atmosphere, you know, within special education class is not very supportive, you know. So then, you know, when they needed to, to design, you know, these robots together and call them, so they, then they figure out that it makes sense to ask for advice. So then the, the, the collaboration within classroom and the co-design process was getting much more encouraging. And, and, and there are many things to do. Now we want to, to set up something similar at this um, Karjalohja school, also primary school. And I have to say, um, I, I would have a lot of stories from Karjalohja school, but, but you know, when I went there and for, for my first time, and, and, uh, and you know, the kids had so many questions. The first question was like, 
what's your best invention? And can you imagine that sharp question? Uh, and I think that that's also like, you know, this is the thing. Uh, what is it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Come on, I'm done with my lecture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you see that it, it's also something that you know you you are forced to think. You 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 are forced to say that what exactly is your invention, and 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 so I see that you know with this sort of like openness of of kids, it's not only good for kids but it's also good for sort of grown-ups, and and um, and it it's something like I, I would I would like we have been thinking of concerning this AI to come up with some sort of fusion course so that we could get like in summer we could come up with an AI course where we have like kids you know from primary school secondary school and then after the researchers you know to to uh, to look into some phenomenon you know that is somehow uh, where you know AI has a role in and, and Laszlo will probably do it <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, but but you know something like that so I, I, I find it you know very exciting it, it's just that you know it's important that the ki kids also learn like also these technical skills you know so that they are able to not only give ideas but but really be part of the process of, of, of uh, doing things okay let's see if there are more questions uh, I think that if there are no more questions, because I know that Erki has to leave uh, not too late. Yeah, but uh, we I'm need to go to birthday party to Rama now immediately. Yes, okay. <laughs> That's yes, yes, sorry about Hi. that. <laughs> we are leaving Hi. immediately. Yes, because Yari Vahanto is turning 60 today and he said that why are you not coming? Because you were invited. You can wish him happy birthday here live yes, on TV. Exactly. Here. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. But okay, yes. Uh, so yes. therefore, uh, maybe you can stay still 10 minutes or so. So if yes. people want to uh, come and ask uh, questions uh, to you, yeah. uh, maybe in Finnish or individually, yes, yes. they have time to, to do yes. it now. And, and, and really, and you are welcome also to come anytime to my department or my home that you know the address. Of, so yes, and now everyone will know it. Yes. Uh, we will send uh, emails to everyone. And and thank you so much. This has been extremely interesting. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Thank you very much.